Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here with another <laughs> we're here with another jam-packed uh, <laughs> information overload just for you. I have to laugh because usually before we start the show, uh, my producer uh, Dallas Pearson and I are usually on the same page when it comes to which camera I'm going to be speaking into, and that was the one thing that we both overlooked and uh, we got it wrong. Anyhow, uh, here we are. And it is the 19th of July today, 2018. And we do have a jam-packed, action-filled information overload coming your way. There's a lot of things. Um, last week's show, we, had, we were trying to cover three things. Uh, we started off with a Prager University segment on the su suicide of Europe, and we said we're going to get back to that. But instead, we focused the entire hour on President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh. But then we still had to get to uh, his Trump's meeting in NATO and, of course, the Trump-Putin uh, press conference or, or summit that was coming up. And then we also had the Peter Strzok FBI agent testimony in front of a joint session of Congress. A lot of stuff going on amongst those three things. We only covered one last week. This week we are only going to cover one. So we were going to do Peter Strzok this week. Uh, we have decided to push, push that back for another week, so we will try to bring you that next week. And we are going to focus in on some international affairs and try to bring you the historical context into some of the events that are going on around the world. Because history is important. So that being said, we are going to actually start off by going to 1862 with our Prager University segment on the amazing life of Ulysses S. Grant. And before we play this video, just want to let you know Ulysses Grant would be my sixth cousin five times removed if he were still alive today. All right, here's Prager University. The year was 1862. America was in the depths of the Civil War. Looking back, it's easy to believe that a Union victory was inevitable. The North had more money, more population, more industry, but no one thought that at the time. In the first year of the war, it looked as if the South would win. A series of high-profile victories in the East convinced many that Confederates were better fighters under better leaders. Where would President Lincoln find a battlefield general who could do for the Union what Robert E. Lee was doing for the Confederacy? Lead it to victory. The man he found, the man who saved the Union, was Ulysses S. Grant. He wasn't Lincoln's first choice, or second, or third. In fact, when the war started in 1861, Lincoln had no idea who Ulysses S. Grant was. Hardly surprising, since at the time, Grant was selling hats to farmers' wives in a small town in Illinois. His rise to glory is one of the most amazing stories in American history. Born in Ohio on April 27, 1822, Grant had no ambition to be a soldier. His father pushed him into it, thinking he wasn't suited for much else. Grant's West Point career wasn't especially distinguished either. But during the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, Grant proved himself to be an officer of unusual ability. He was cool under fire, daring but rarely reckless. Even more important, the men under his command trusted him. After that war, Grant returned to St. Louis to marry his fiancée, Julia Dent, the daughter of a slave-owning Missouri farmer. Grant was never happier than when he was with Julia, and he was never unhappier than when he was not. Unfortunately, in this period, army life forced them to be separated, sometimes for many months. To assuage his loneliness, Grant started to drink. While in a distant posting in Northern California, a thousand miles from Julia, his drinking got the better of him. He resigned his army commission to avoid an embarrassing court-martial. It was downhill from there, one business venture failing after another. By 1860, thoroughly humiliated and with no money and no prospects, he was back working for his father in the small town of Galena, Illinois. Then the Civil War happened. The Union was in desperate need of experienced soldiers. Grant volunteered. His leadership skills were immediately obvious. He quickly advanced through the ranks. In a little more than six months, he scored two major victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson along the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. He followed these up with victory in the largest battle in American history up to that time, the Battle of Shiloh, making him a true Union hero in a cause that was starved for heroes. There was nothing flashy about Grant's generalship. All he did was win. 
Unlike the overly cautious generals that drove President Lincoln to distraction, Grant's battle plan was to always move forward, always put pressure on his foes. Any advantage the Union had in technology or manpower, he employed to the fullest. Like Napoleon, Grant was a superb reader of maps. He could identify the enemy's vulnerabilities and exploit them, as he did in his brilliant 1863 campaign for Vicksburg, a campaign that is still studied at war colleges. In March 1864, Lincoln made Grant commander of all the Union armies. It took more than a year of the war's hardest fighting before Lee surrendered and the war finally came to an end. By this point, the president and his general had developed a close bond. Shortly after Grant returned to Washington, Lincoln invited the Grants to join him and Mary Lincoln at Ford's Theater. Grant accepted. Julia, however, had developed an intense dislike for Mary Lincoln and insisted that her husband get out of the commitment. Embarrassed, Grant did. That night, in that theater, Lincoln was assassinated. As the commander of all Union armies, Grant was placed in a terrible bind, having to walk a tightrope between new President Andrew Johnson's pro-South agenda, which favored the old white aristocracy, and protecting, as Lincoln intended, the newly won rights of the freed slaves. Grant had saved America once as a general. Could he save it again as a politician? Running as the Republican candidate for president, Grant easily won election in 1868, and then again in 1872. During his tenure, he fought to secure the passage of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed all American citizens the right to vote, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. He created the Department of Justice, broke up the Ku Klux Klan, and advocated for the rights of Indians. He presided over the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad and a rapidly expanding industrial economy. But Grant wasn't done. One week before his death, on July 23, 1885, he completed his autobiography. It became one of the best-selling books of the 19th century. Of Grant's amazing life, Frederick Douglass wrote a fitting epithet. In him, the Negro found a protector, the Indian a friend, a vanquished foe a brother, an imperiled nation a savior. I'm Gary Edelman, Director of History and Education at the Civil War Trust for Prager University. Now we play that for you today because what Ulysses Grant was able to do was work on establishing peace after a time of war. He was able to give us stability. Grant was more of a forward thinker than a lot of people give him credit for. Now it is true that Ulysses Grant did have some um, bad cabinet officials, some corruption within his cabinet, that did happen. Grant was perhaps a little too trusting of some of the people he surrounded himself with. Kind of wonder what Grant would be like if he had to face today's political environment. But we are now going to move on a little bit towards today's political environment. But before we get there, we are going to look at what happened after World War II. So if you look at what Grant did at the end of the Civil War, now contrast that with what happened at the end of World War II which is another major, major, major conflict. This time it happened in Europe. And of course, we've spent enough time, and I'm sure most people, most viewers know that, you know, what happened during World War II. I'm going to make that assumption that you do. But now, in 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was created. Now, one thing about NATO, when I was a young tyke, still growing up, uh, I was in my preteens or early teenage years, NATO actually sponsored an essay contest for people in my age bracket. I think it was 12 or 13. And I competed in that. And that was the first time I really ever heard of NATO. That was the first time I was actually forced into looking at the history of NATO. And that was like 1979, 1980, 81. I mean, in that time frame. So I've known about NATO for quite a long time. I've, uh, I've studied it, including in college. Uh, so now we're going to give you just a little bit about the history of NATO. The treaty shall enter into force between the states which have ratified it. President Truman signed the North Atlantic Treaty in 1949, forming the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The aim of the U.S. and European allies, stand firm against communism and promote democracy. If there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. Men with courage and vision can still determine their own destiny. 
They can choose slavery or freedom, war or peace. We will now proceed to the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. The initial 12 member countries included Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Britain, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and the United States. Including the ratifications of Belgium. The signing came just a year after the communist takeover of Czechoslovakia and not long after World War II. This four-pointed star is the emblem of NATO. They agreed that NATO's mission would be to safeguard the freedom and security of its members through political and military means. And they agreed in the treaty's Article 5 that an armed attack against one or more of them shall be considered an attack against them all. During the war, the Soviet Union had already absorbed parts of Finland. The Soviet Cold War nuclear buildup would force NATO to deploy cruise missiles in Europe. President Jimmy Carter. We face a challenge of promoting the human values and human rights that are the final purpose and meaning of our alliance. The task is not easy. The way to liberty has never been. Our opportunity clearly is to bring the world closer to our vision. The Cold War with Soviet nuclear escalation tested NATO, but by 1989, revolution began and communism began to crumble. NATO continues to serve as the main forum where the West can formulate and coordinate common political decisions. A new era of peace is being hailed in Europe tonight after the summit meeting of NATO leaders. By 1993, NATO extended its hand to former Warsaw Pact members, and by 2002, seven former Eastern Bloc countries were invited to join. For me, this is a miracle. This is a miracle of freedoms. It would be the mid-1990s before NATO took its first wartime action in the Bosnian War. All efforts to achieve a negotiated political solution to the cause of a crisis have failed and no alternative is open but to take uh, military action. NATO intervened again during the Serbian crackdown on Albanian civilians in Kosovo. Military might would be needed again after the 9-11 attacks when NATO invoked Article 5 for the first time in its history and joined the U.S. in attacking Afghanistan. At this critical moment, the United States can rely on its 18 allies in North America and Europe for both assistance and for support. We do not defeat the terrorists in Afghanistan. We will face them on our own soil. And since civilians in Europe and North America would then pay the price. With that war ending, NATO's 28 member countries come to Chicago to focus on preparing for the threats and challenges of the 21st century. Chicago is a city built upon diversity and determination. And uh, those values underpin NATO too. So Chicago is a fitting host for the NATO summit as we endeavor to implement our vision of an alliance ready to tackle the security challenges of the 21st century. Steve Grzanich, News Radio, WBBM. Now, at the end of that piece, it was talking about the NATO summit in Chicago. This was done in, uh, prep uh, in preparation of that, and that was, I think, back in like 2012. So it's an older video, but I wanted to give you a little bit of the context as to the origins of NATO. You had the Soviet Union and their Warsaw Pact uh, countries. Then you had the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as a Western rival. And that was a good part to do with the Cold War. Uh, with buffer states. In fact, in 1955, Germany was not an original member of NATO. Uh, 1952, February 18th, uh, Greece and Turkey were the first non-founders uh, admitted. And then West Germany joined in, on um, May 6, 1955. And then on October 3rd, 1990, with the reunification of Germany from East Germany and West Germany merging into one, um, NATO accepted membership of East Germany as part of the unification on October 3rd, 1990. So Germany has been a member of NATO for a long time. That is going to be key as we continue today's discussion. So right now we're going to kind of up that uh, the uh, timetable here. We're going to go to 2009. This is something that occurred in Minneapolis. Uh, this is just a brief 22 second clip and it has to show uh, a peace protest. Blood for oil! USA for Rocky soil! No blood for oil! USA for Rocky soil! 
Iraqi soil. No blood for oil. USA for Iraqi soil. No blood for oil. No blood for oil. Remember that when we get through the rest of today's discussion. So NATO and no blood for oil. And mind you, that protest occurred after President Obama was inaugurated, so we're not going back to the Bush administration for the sake of today's narrative. Um, and I really wanted to start with what happened in Libya. No, I'm not talking about Benghazi. <laughs> we're actually going to go back before Benghazi. Uh, there were international forces, including from NATO backing, uh, in, going in to um, take out Muammar Gaddafi and essentially institute a civil war in Libya. Do you know why Libya was subject to European and American attacks? We've actually covered, the, covered this a little bit on previous episodes of the show. We're going to play this clip, and then I will give you the answer. The first sorties in a campaign to stop Gaddafi's onslaught. French fighter aircraft take off from Dijon Air Base. Their target, pro-Gaddafi armored vehicles near the opposition-held city of Benghazi. The airstrikes came just hours after world leaders gathered in Paris. Their aim, to agree the final details of a no-fly zone over Libyan airspace. A sense of urgency weighed over these talks. The international community has taken its time in reacting to events in Libya. Now, late in the day, it's decision time. At the end of the talks, President Sarkozy delivered this stark message. Today, we are intervening in Libya under a mandate from the UN Security Council alongside our partners in particular, our Arab partners. And we are doing this in order to protect the civilian population from the murderous madness of a regime that by killing its own people has lost all legitimacy. And the American Secretary of State added her country's unequivocal support for the action. Now America has unique capabilities and we will bring them to bear to help our European and Canadian allies and Arab partners stop further violence against civilians, including through the effective implementation of a no-fly zone. At military bases across southern Europe, signs of attack aircraft preparing for action. British fighter jets are expected to join the French in launching airstrikes, while American, Canadian and Spanish aircraft are also poised to take off. One of their priorities will be to take out Gaddafi's air defences so that other aircraft can operate freely in the skies over Libya. For the residents of Ben Ghazi, this military intervention is coming in the nick of time because Gaddafi's forces are already closing in on the city. The message from Paris is that the international community is finally moving from words to action. The people of eastern Libya will be hoping it's not too late. Jackie Rowland, Al Jazeera. Paris. Okay, now, here line. is what I wanted to tell you. I wanted to go to the clip first because I needed to pull it up. This is from the International Energy Agency. This is from 2011 uh, on oil supply in Libya. Libya, a member of OPEC, produced some 1.69 uh, million barrels a day of oil, crude, and natural gas liquids in January 2011. Uh, 1.58 uh, million barrels a day of which was crude and a further 0.1 million barrels a day of natural gas. Uh, of these volumes, some 1.49 million barrels per day were exported. Now, we, that's the overall part of the con uh, country and then it's um, kilo barrels per day is what we're going to have here on, uh, on the uh, exports. Because there's a chart here, unfortunately I can't show it to you, of crude oil uh, imported from Libya, so it's Libyan exports, uh, in kilobarrels per day. And it, it goes from 2000, the years 2007 to 2010. And I'm going to just 
pull off the 2010 numbers from a few choice countries, and I because there's a lot listed here. Um, 2010, uh, France, 205 kilobarrels per day. Kilobarrels, 1,000 barrels per day. Uh, Germany, 144 kilobarrels per day. Um, Italy, 376 kilobarrels per day. Spain, 136 kilobarrels per day. Uh, United Kingdom, 95 kilobarrels per day. And the United States, 51 kilobarrels per day. That's what we were importing from Libya. 2010, Germany was taking 144,000 barrels of oil per day from Libya. That's a lot of oil coming from one small Middle Eastern African country. Um, there was a push to get rid of Gaddafi. There was a push, and, and it all had to deal with Europeans getting their oil from Libya. That's the crux of why we went into war with Libya, why we had airstrikes over Libya, why we took Muammar Gaddafi out. It was all about the oil. And we talk about no blood for oil in Iraq, but I didn't hear the protest too loud when it came to no blood for oil in Libya. Perhaps because the protest side with the presidential administration that was in power when the Libyan decision was made. But that war protest, the anti-war protest, is not too loud compared to when George H.W. Bush was in office. Or when George, uh, or George W. Bush was in office, or his father, George H.W. Bush, or when Ronald Reagan was in office. The anti-war protest was extremely loud then. But it was minuscule when Obama was there. Now, as we had just saw in that clip, there was a small protest in Minneapolis. So I'm glad to see that there was some consistency amongst uh, some of the uh, organizers of that movement. But in 2010, 144,000 barrels of oil per day were exported from Libya to Germany. 205,000 barrels of oil was exported from Libya to France every single day. 51,000 barrels of oil were exported from Libya to the United States every single day in 2011. So now, let's hear what Se then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had to say about Libya uh, after the NATO meeting in April of 2011. And mind you, that previous clip was March of 2011. So here is Secretary, then Secretary Clinton in April 2011 discussing Libya. I think the bottom line is that uh, here at NATO we achieved a solid and sustainable consensus on our objectives and what it will take to achieve them. I spoke at length with many of my counterparts about the practical steps we all have to take to pressure and isolate Gaddafi and advance our efforts to protect the Libyan people. I have to say I'm not surprised at anything that uh, Colonel Gaddafi and his forces do, but that is worrying information and it's one of the reasons why uh, the fight in Misrata is so difficult, uh, because it's at close quarters, it's uh, in amongst uh, urban areas, uh, and it uh, poses a lot of challenges to both NATO and to the opposition. One of NATO's most important partners is Russia. Last year at Lisbon, we made historic progress together. Today, we worked to translate the promise of that moment into practical steps that strengthen our collective security. Did you hear that? No, I'm not talking about that loud little thing at the end. NATO was formed to fight Russia in the Soviet Union. Now, Hillary Clinton in 2011 said that one of NATO's most important partners is Russia? Why do we have NATO? The Warsaw Pact has been kind of abolished and it's been disintegrated. Why are we still holding on to NATO? If NATO was formed to be the rival to the Soviet Union and the Russians, and if the Russians are the enemy, as we keep hearing in the media today in 2018, how can Hillary Clinton in 2011 say, 
Well, Russia is one of the most important allies that NATO has. This is the Obama-Clinton foreign policy. That was Hillary Clinton's own words in April of 2011. So now, what else happened? Let's go to July of 2011. Here is a segment on uh, the uh, cash flow regarding oil in July of 2011. And this is uh, a package done by RT. Well, Germany says it will lend Libya's rebels 100 million euros for, quote, civilian and humanitarian purposes. Well, Berlin opposed the Western military intervention in the country, but promised to help oust Colonel Gaddafi through peaceful means. Well, let's now talk to Christoph Horstel, a government consultant in Germany, and he joins us live from Berlin. Thank you very much for being on the program this evening. So this money is supposed to be used for peaceful purposes, humanitarian purposes, but is there anything that Berlin can can actually do to stop it from being spent on arms. And after all, that's what the opposition says it wants most. You see, it is really a big question what this money is being used for. First of all, who controls that? Then next, has NATO ever cared for the civilian population in Libya? I don't think so. Uh, you know, a group of countries bombing Libya and using uranium weapons. That, of course, is a group of countries not caring for the civilian population. I see definitely another point here. I see that the important uh, port town of Brigga, which is hotly debated among the rebels and the government as who owns uh, this town now, uh, might be a question where some of this money might be used, in fact, to buy the tribes to get the town into the hands of the rebels. I think that's the question here, uh, quite importantly, right now, to use that money. I doubt what is official language of the German government. Well, yeah, there are mixed messages coming from Berlin, isn't it, over this whole uh, Libyan affair. First, it didn't back the no-fly zone resolution. Then it said it would give arms to NATO's efforts. And now we're hearing money's heading to the rebels. So what, just what is going on? What is the goal of the German government here? You see, the problem was when our foreign minister made that decision to uh, not vote with NATO uh, this time in the Security Council, he was told by all the officials, including our secret services, that Libya is a dirty game. And of course, you know, what, what could he do then? He, he thought, I could not be part of that game because I don't want to be part of another dirty game. We did that already in Afghanistan. We abstained in Iraq, and now uh, we have this Libyan case on hand. And meanwhile, we did two other countries, and we are still doing Kosovo. So uh, where the hell this is going to? And he said, we are not into it. But abstaining, just being neutral in this case, of course, was not enough because NATO has used the security resolution as a you know free hand to do just anything they want and in fact they are fighting on the side of the rebels they're fighting the Libyan government and that is something that you know how to say cannot uh, rest the whole world in peace because nobody knows when NATO will decide to you know protect some civil populations and then uh, meanwhile kill the legal government whether we like it or not that's the situation here okay mr. Horstel now aside from the uh, money that the uh, uh, German government is giving. The Libyan rebels have also recently gained access to uh, Colonel Gaddafi's frozen assets in the U.S., and that's after Washington, of course, gave them full diplomatic recognition. Do you think now that this will break the stalemate, that having so much funding will actually swing the balance in this uh, civil war? Yeah, of course, that's, that's the question. There are more than $20 billion uh, in freezed assets, and I think... Uh, as it was also announced uh, behind the scenes, you know, that this money is going to be used to uh, help the rebels. But of course, that is, uh, in a way, totally illegal. Uh, you, you can't just take money away from, from governments and uh, give it to rebels. If this is uh, the future policy, uh, that would be a very tough situation uh, on this globe. Okay, just a bit more push on uh, Germans, uh, the Germany's uh, position here. NATO has called on its members for more active involvement in the Libyan campaign. Germany, of course, has not participated in the military efforts so far, but it did say it wants NATO's mission to be successful. Do you think we will see Berlin actually joining the campaign one day? 
Well, uh, let's put it this way. If the pressure by NATO, by Washington, on Germany prevails and continues and grows stronger, then we might see a lot of things uh, which uh, many people may regret, including Russia and China. Uh, but that is not sure. So far, the govern German government stays somehow within the lines it has taken. Uh, but of course, within this bandwidth of uh, possible decisions, it is now in a siding very closely with Washington and as an Arab journalist pointed out to me, Germany wants a piece of the cake. To be, to be clear, Germany wants to maintain its 15% of the Libyan oil as a percentage of the total oil imports of Germany. Okay, thank you very much for your contribution, your insight there. Christoph Horstel, a government consultant in Germany. Thank you. So why did we go into Libya? Because Germany wanted more oil, or at least maintain. The problem, of course, has been Germany. I swear they've been setting us up for World War III in Europe, and we can have another show on European wars uh, in the future. Uh, we're going to move up to March 2012. This is when President Obama met with uh, Medvedev, one of the uh, key advisors to Vladimir Putin. And this, you may have already heard it, but in case you haven't, you might want to hear it again. Dallas, let's play that one more time. My last question, please. Yeah. Uh, After my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I transmit this information to Vladimir and Mr. Denver. This is my last election. I will have more flexibility. Transmit this to Putin. Talk about collusion with Trump. Think you need to go back and take a look at Barack Obama. His relationship between Vladimir Putin and uh, Angela Merkel over oil. Get rid of the oil in Libya. What happens next? You got to replace that supply somewhere. You got to keep the lights on. You got to keep the heating oil coming. You got to keep the gasoline flowing to the automobiles. So, where does Germany get its oil if the Libyan oil is offline? Hmm. Perhaps some you know, important ally to the north that NATO was supposed to fight, but now they're making an ally. Um, somebody who would be granted more flexibility, just maybe. So let's take a look now, before we actually get further in, uh, May of 2014, so we're going up two more years, uh, with President Obama and Angela Merkel. President Obama and Chancellor Merkel both said the Kremlin will face new sanctions if it continues to interfere in Ukraine, and particularly in that country's presidential election set for May 25th. Russia has consistently denied such interference. The Russian leadership must know that if it continues to destabilize eastern Ukraine and disrupt this month's presidential election, we will move quickly on additional steps, including further sanctions that will impose greater costs. The 25th of May is not all that far away. Should that not be possible to stabilize the situation, further sanctions will be unavoidable. Mr. Obama and Ms. Merkel met shortly after Ukraine launched its first major offensive against pro-Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. Two Ukrainian pilots taking part in the raids were killed when their helicopters were shot down in Slovyansk. Officials in Moscow said the offensive means the Geneva Agreement to defuse tensions is doomed. Russia called a United Nations Security Council meeting Friday to discuss the situation. Russia's UN ambassador, Vitaly Cherkin, called on Ukraine and what he called its Western enablers to not commit a fatal error and stop Kiev's offensive. Washington's UN envoy, Samantha Power, defended the Ukrainian action. The country that has a right of self-defense, Ambassador Cherkin, is Ukraine. 
U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, speaking Friday at Washington's Wilson Center, called on America's NATO allies to increase spending on joint defense. He said alliance members have had a false sense of security since the end of the Cold War. We must see renewed financial commitments from all NATO members. Russia's actions in Ukraine have made NATO's value abundantly clear. And I know from my frequent conversations with NATO defense ministers that they do not need any convincing on this point. Ukraine has reported many pro-Russia separatists dead and wounded in its operation. Kent Klein, VOA News, Washington. First of all, did you hear what uh, then UN Secretary, or uh, what um, Chuck Hagel had to say? Renewed contributions for all NATO members is required. Chuck, are you the one who gave Donald Trump that information? Because that's pretty much what he later on said. This is what Chuck Hagel said, Democrat. NATO members must contribute more. I still don't know why the Democratic Party has a problem when Donald Trump says that to NATO members. Hegel said it. Oh, but that's called whataboutism these days. Because if the Democrats do something, and then if Donald Trump does it, it's called whataboutism, as if it's not valid. But that's another argument for another day. Um, so here we have, we have President Obama and Angela Merkel blaming Russia for everything. Russians deny it. But then what happens next? After all these denials and all, Russia constructs a new gas pipeline to Germany. Yes, that did happen. Here is RT from June of 2015. St. Petersburg, Russia's northern capital, is welcoming business magnates with the buzz of expected deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars in the air. Some deals not long coming, as we reported a few hours ago. Russian energy major Gazprom has already announced it's agreed with European firms to build a new gas pipeline direct from Russia to the EU under the Baltic. Artis Murugaziev has more about the big money contract really is an international project. You have Royal Dutch Shell, uh, a German uh, utilities company, E.ON, OMV, an Austrian oil major, and Russia's Gazprom, uh, a really international venture to lay this new gas uh, pipeline from Russia under the Baltic Sea uh, to Germany. According to the agreement, uh, from what we know, Gazprom will own no less than half the shares in this new project. Well, you know, we've uh, been uh, hearing applause clapping as uh, deals have been signed left and right here, mostly at uh, energy firms, stalls dotted uh, around here at the venue. But also today we're, we're hoping to see uh, a deal between BP and uh, Russian uh, oil giant Rosneft uh, for BP, the British oil company, to buy in uh, to a Russian gas field. That's going to be around 700 million euros. Uh, there are other deals as well uh, that will take place today, uh, according to the plan. But there will also be a surprise guest, a very surprising guest, the uh, Saudi uh, defense minister, third in line for the crown. He's uh, come uh, on an unannounced, really, visit to St. Petersburg. There's hardly any warning uh, for some tete-a-tete, -tete, you know, time with Vladimir Putin. We don't know exactly what, the, what it is they'll be talking about, but also happening today. Well, uh, let's uh, hear from Jean-Pierre Thomas again. I spoke to him a bit earlier on. He's at that forum. He thinks the forum perfectly reflects the uh, latest trends in the global economy. The reality of the economy, it's around here. I crossed this morning a lot of these French businessmen, German one, Chinese, all around the world, and even French politicians. And, uh, but there is one thing new, that you have more Asian people than before. That means that uh, Europe is losing market share because it's a big, big mistake. But I am convinced that the reality of economy, because the people, the gen young generation, the population are friendly, they want to work, they want to earn money, and it's more strong than uh, the political and mediatic uh, gesticulations. So there you have it in... 2015, June 2015, Russia and Germany worked together on getting a gas pipeline. Hmm. This was the Obama administration legacy. 
that that's their policies. They're the ones who put all that together. We look at Benghazi. Well, Benghazi should never have actually happened on September 11th, 2011. It should never have happened. We should never have gone into Libya to begin with. But you had German greed. French are probably co-conspirators there. I don't know if this was German-led or Obama-led. And I'm not going to speculate on either or. I know all three of those countries were in it together at that time. So essentially, Arab Spring, con Arab Spring continued. We, how many Libyans had to die? No blood for oil, the Democrat protesters will come out and yell. But if Libyan lives are lost, it doesn't matter. It, not if a Democrat president is the one who puts their lives in jeopardy. Now, it's only the Republicans are the evil warmongers, according to the anti-war left. I'm just here to give you the truth. Yes, I am actually, you know, painting a uh, more specific a a allegation, accusation on President Obama. I know he's no longer the president. But if we are going to actually understand what is going on in today's foreign policy, we have to understand some of the issues that led up to it. So now we had the election. Now we're hearing all this stuff about Russian collusion, which probably didn't exist. Donald Trump becomes the president. Then in May of this year, just a couple of months ago, Germany and the U.S. disagree over Russia's new Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Here we go. These steel pipes will be part of a vast undersea pipeline bringing gas from Russia to Germany's Baltic coast. The Nord Stream 2 project will double the amount of natural gas Russia can funnel directly to the heart of Europe from newly tapped reserves in Siberia. That worries the US, who believe the project could be a security risk and its threatening sanctions. But a Nord Stream spokesman suggested Russia wouldn't be able to use its gas supplies as a political tool because the rest of Europe relies on many sources for its energy needs. There are opportunities for most of the countries to get their gas from various sources. The competition within the domestic market is working and therefore this pipeline cannot be used to blackmail or negatively affect any country but it will play a role in securing the gas supply and it will also be an important competitive factor. The Nord Stream route will deliberately avoid Ukraine which means it will lose the lucrative transit payments it gets from existing Russian pipelines across its territory. Ukraine stands to lose 2% of its GDP. Such a project is questionable in an energy, economic and political way because it disadvantages Ukraine. One will try to find a solution for Ukraine. A compromise could be that on the one hand the pipeline project isn't blocked any further and on the other hand Russia would commit itself to keep using the gas route through Ukraine so that all sides have a face-saving result. The stakes for Germany are high, it's Europe's biggest economy, its energy needs are growing and it's already the world's largest importer of natural gas. If you go back 10 or 20 years, you'll just add it all up. It's massive amounts of money. So for the last 18 months, we've heard that Russia is the enemy, yet in 2011, Hillary Clinton said that Russia was an ally of NATO. So here... The big bad Russian bear is back because the Democrats and their friends in the mainstream media all say so. And they expect you to believe that. But on the other hand, they're going to create a war in Libya. They're going to destabilize that North African country only because they want to cut deals to get more and more oil and natural gas from Russia. But yet Russia's our enemy, according to Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama. In 2011, they were our allies. Now they're our enemy because Donald Trump is president. 
There's some inconsistencies with what the Democrat leadership has to say. Their actions speak completely different than their words. So now, President Trump, a little over a week ago, while he was on his way to Helsinki, Finland, stops over and actually meets with uh, uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg. They had a press conference in the morning. Now, of course, there's one small little clip that was released. We're going to play the entire exchange more so you have more of a context as to what they had to say. If you go back 10 or 20 years, you'll just add it all up. It's massive amounts of money is owed. Uh, the United States has paid and stepped up like nobody. This has gone on for decades, by the way. This has gone on for many presidents, but no other president brought it up like I bring it up. Uh, so something has to be done, and the Secretary General has been working on it very hard. This year, since our last meeting, commitments have been made for over $40 billion more money spent by other countries. So that's a step, but it's a very small step. It sounds like a lot of money, and it is. But it's a very small amount of money relative what, to what they owe and to what they should be paying. And it's an unfair burden on the United States. So we're here to talk about that, and I'm sure it will be resolved. I have a great confidence in the Secretary General. He's worked very, very hard on this, and he knows it's a fact. But uh, I have great confidence in him and his representatives. Would you like to say yeah. something? First of all, it's great to see you again, Mr. President, and uh, good to have you here for the uh, summit. And uh, we are going to discuss many important issues at the summit. Among them is defense spending. And we all agree that we have to do more. I agree with you that we have to uh, make sure that allies are investing more. The good news is that uh, allies have started to invest more in uh, defense. Uh, after years of cutting defense budgets, they have started to uh, add billions to the defense budgets. And uh, last year was the biggest increase uh, in defense spending across Europe and Canada in a generation. Why was that last year? It's also because of your leadership, because of your clear message. And, uh, and, uh, they won't write that. But no, won't. I have said it before, and, and the, but the thing is that uh, uh, it really has... Uh, uh, it's, it, your message is having an impact, uh, and uh, we are going to build on that to make sure that we have further increases. Uh, you initiated last year that uh, all allies are going to develop national plans on how to spend more on defense. And based on these nas national plans, we now estimate that the uh, European allies and Canada will add 266 uh, uh, extra US dollars uh, for defense from now until 20 uh, billion US dollars until uh, until 2024. So, so this is really adding some extra money. It helps, uh, and we are moving in the right direction. But we still, uh, but, oh, but we still have to uh, to do more, and that is what we want to address at the summit later on today. Let me also add that that strong NATO is good for Europe, but it's also good for the United States. Uh, the U.S. military presence in Europe helps uh, to protect Europe, but it also helps the United States to project uh, uh, power to the Middle East, to Africa, and uh, I think also that the cloud, the military cloud of, uh, uh, of Europe, uh, the economic cloud, the political cloud, also is helpful dealing with, uh, with Russia, and we look forward to the meeting we're going to have with President Putin, uh, and I think that leaders are also looking forward to uh, your thoughts about the meeting with President Putin at, uh, later on? Uh. Well, I have to say, I think uh, it's very sad when Germany makes a massive oil and gas deal with Russia where you're supposed to be guarding against Russia and Germany goes out and pays billions and billions of dollars a year to Russia. So we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting all of these countries. And then numerous of the countries go out and make a pipeline deal with Russia where they're paying billions of dollars into the coffers of Russia. So we're supposed to protect you against Russia, but they're paying billions of dollars to Russia, and I think that's very inappropriate. And the former chancellor of Germany is the head of the pipeline company that's supplying the gas. Uh, ultimately, Germany will have almost 70 percent of their country controlled by Russia with natural gas. So you tell me, is that Appropriate. I mean, we've, I've been complaining about this from the time I got in. It should have never been allowed to have happened. 
But Germany is totally controlled by Russia because they were getting from 60 to 70 percent of their energy from Russia and a new pipeline. And you tell me if that's appropriate, because I think it's not. And I think it's a very bad thing for NATO, and I don't think it should have happened. And I think we have to talk to Germany about it. On top of that, Germany is just paying a little bit over 1 percent, whereas the United States, in actual numbers, is paying 4.2 percent of a much larger GDP. So I think that's inappropriate also. You know, we're protecting Germany, we're protecting France, we're protecting everybody. And yet, we're paying a lot of money to protect. Now, this has been going on for decades. This has been brought up by other presidents, but other presidents never did anything about it because I don't think they understood it or they just didn't want to get involved. But I have to bring it up because I think it's very unfair to our country. It's very unfair to our taxpayer. And I think that these countries have to step it up, not over a 10-year period. They have to step it up immediately. Germany is a rich country. They talk about they're going to increase it a tiny bit by 2030. Well, they could increase it immediately tomorrow and have no problem. I don't think it's fair to the United States. So we're going to have to do something because we're not going to put up with it. We can't put up with it. And it's inappropriate. So we have to talk about the billions and billions of dollars that's being paid to the country that we're supposed to be protecting you against. You know, everybody's, everybody's talking about it all over the world. They'll say, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to be protecting you from Russia, but why are you paying billions of dollars to Russia for energy? Why are countries in NATO, namely Germany, having a large percentage of their energy needs paid, you know, to Russia and, and taken care of by Russia? Now, if you look at it, Germany is a captive of Russia because they supply. They got rid of their coal plants. They got rid of their nuclear. They're getting so much of the oil and gas from Russia. I think it's something that NATO has to look at. I think it's very inappropriate. You and I agree that it's inappropriate. I don't know what you can do about it now, but it certainly doesn't seem to make sense that uh, they pay billions of dollars to Russia, and now we have to defend them against Russia. You know, NATO is an alliance of 29 nations, and uh, there are sometimes differences and uh, different views and also some disagreements, and uh, gas, uh, uh, pipeline from Russia to Germany is one issue where allies uh, disagree. But the strength of NATO is that despite these differences, we have always been able to unite around our core task uh, to protect and defend each other because we understand that we are stronger together than uh, apart. I think that two world wars and the Cold War thought was that uh, we are stronger together than apart. Um, but how can you be together when a country is getting its energy from the person you want protection against or from the group that you want protection against? Because you understand that uh, when we stand together, also when uh, dealing with Russia, we are stronger. I think what we have seen is that... No, you're just making Russia richer. Well, you're not dealing with Russia, you're making Russia richer. Also, I think that even during the Cold War, uh, NATO allies were trading with uh, Russia. Then there have been uh, disagreements about what kind of uh, trade arrangements we should, uh, we sure. should go I into. think trade is wonderful. I think energy is a whole different story. I think energy is a much different story than normal trade. And you have a country like Poland that won't accept the gas. You take a look at some of the countries, they won't accept it because they don't want to be captive to Russia. Mm -hmm. But Germany, as far as I'm concerned, is captive to Russia because it's getting so much of its energy from Russia. Mm. So we're supposed to protect Germany, but they're getting their energy from Russia. Explain that. And it can't be explained, you know. All right, thank you, Press. Thank you. Thank you, Press. Thank you, Press. Thank you, Press. Thank you. Thank you. So now, does what I've, say, I've said this hour and the clips that I've shown start making sense? Why did Trump say what he said at that NATO meeting? Because of all of the stuff that happened before, and it really goes back to Libya. That's the connection. Um, I am going to also mention briefly about oil before we leave from this topic. Uh, and I know we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try to make it quick. This is something we've, we'd shown on the sh uh, program about two years ago. Uh, when it came to ISIS, ISIS took Middle Eastern oil from the fields that they had captured and they funneled that oil up to Turkey. Well, at that point in time, they were competing with the Russians, so the Russians and the Turks didn't like each other. But then the Kurds were also in the area, and they had oil in their possession, and they 
shipped theirs over to Israel. Huh. Barack Obama tried undermining Benjamin Netanyahu many, many times. I wonder why. So this is all blood for oil. And yet it's the Democrats who are the ones who put us there, into that position. And yet it's Trump who gets criticized when he's trying, by those who are anti-war protesters, who is trying to get us out of that position and actually make a better world. So now in the moment that we've got left, um, well, let's just take a look at the next clip. Uh, President Trump went to Helsinki, Finland, and he met with the president of Finland. Warm welcome, and we wish all the success in uh, your meetings and negotiations with uh, President Putin. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we very much appreciate Finland. We very highly respect your country. Our relationship has been a very good one, and our personal relationship has been very good, and I enjoyed being with you a couple of days ago. <laughs> NATO has, uh, I think, never been stronger, and it was really, it was a little bit tough at the beginning, and it turned out to be love. Uh, it really was a great meeting that we had and brought everybody together, and uh, I think uh, very worthwhile, but I appreciated your support and your help, and I will say again, uh, you've treated us beautifully. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. We'll be seeing him in a little while. <laughs> we'll do just fine. Thank you. Mr. We'll President, uh, I'm from Finnish Press. Uh, what was the last choice to, to collect Finland as a meeting? Well, we think Finland's a great country. We had a fantastic meeting uh, a few days ago. Some of you were there. It was a very successful meeting. I think uh, NATO has never been more together. Uh, people are now agreeing to pay, and we were having a lot of problem with a lot of people not paying, as the President will tell you. Uh, and they're paying, and they're paying more rapidly, and I think NATO's probably never been stronger than it is today. So we had a fantastic meeting, and now we're capping it with being in Finland. And the hospitality has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Now, as a Finnish American, I have to say I was beaming a little bit with pride when I heard that. Uh, my mother's uh, side of the family originates from Finland. Uh, it's a country I've never been to. I looked forward to actually visiting there someday, but I still consider that very much my homeland. Uh, but then President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin, they met. They talked for a couple of hours behind closed doors. Not to, nobody really knows what they said. They came out for a press conference. Press conference was awful. Do you know why it was awful? It was awful because all the journalists really wanted to ask were questions about the 2016 election. That was 18 months ago. Oh, uh, are you going to tell Putin that he can't collude anymore? Putin did one thing. He said, hey, why don't we send uh, Mueller's team over to investigate the 12 people who, the 12 Russians that uh, were indicted, you know, or, or Rosenstein indicted with the Department of Justice. I mean, the, the leaders all know that that is a farce. It's the Democrats can't fa face the fact that they lost an election. Um, We've got bigger issues at work. We've got geopolitical issues at work. We've got a setup for possible World War III, and Trump and Putin are probably trying to disarm. Would you now, with the whole world? That's what happened. Anyhow, that's our show. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams, reminding you you have 158 shopping days left till Christmas. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis. We'll see you next week.